and welcome to another episode of Influence and Growth Mastery. Again, this is Tanya Gossage, your guide to mastering the art of authentic connections, growing your audience, and leveraging influence to create an impactful and thriving business using artificial intelligence. And today I have a very special guest who I met several years ago back during the days of Clubhouse. I know a lot of people still are on Clubhouse. I'm not. Emmanuel, I don't know if you still are, but no. <laughs> Emmanuel, pronounce your last name for me because I've always struggled pronouncing it. Uh, Swichinski. I'm not even going to try. But Emmanuel is with Heart and Soul Company. And I have to tell you that when I met him, and gosh, we were in Clubhouse for quite some time, but I fell in love with his heart and soul. He's such a great guy. But Emmanuel is a compassionate soul dedicated to guiding others to transform self-doubt into self-love. And I have to tell you, he truly is that type of individual. He was so motivating back during, still today, but back during those days, he was so motivating to so many, and especially me. And Emmanuel, I thank you. I have so much gratitude to you for that. But he, with a life story marked by resilience and personal growth, Emmanuel's path has been shaped by defining limitations and embracing self-love. From a young age, Emmanuel faced the challenges of a hearing impairment and childhood bullying, instilling him in a relentless spirit to defining limitations and self-acceptance. Today, Emmanuel's mission is so clear to help individuals finding lasting fulfillment, embracing self-love, and cultivate authentic, purposeful lives. Oh, with unwavering passion and a wealth of experience, here's to guide you one fearless step at a time. Emmanuel, oh, with such heartfelt love, I'm so thrilled to have you here on the show today. Thank you. I'm oh. actually very grateful to be here as well. It's been it's been way too long. I just have to say it's been way too long. I mean, we keep up on social media. But to have you here to where I can actually see you face to face, it's just, um, yeah, like you did. It's just so good to have you here. But, you know, I want to say to the audience, just some things, you know, about your background, Um, you know, some in the here, some in the past, but you have 18 years of experience in the entertainment industry. You know, you've performed around North America, hosted events with over 40,000 people. I mean, goodness, that's so amazing. And, you know, you've done so many things that, you know, people like me and others in the entrepreneurship would love to be able to do. Um, you've had, you have a life-size mural in downtown Toronto, you've had many mentors. You've changed paths after 20 years. And I'm sure maybe we might hear about part of that as we go through your journey today. But you've just recently, I believe, started a new venture with your wife. You've helped thousands, thousands of people transform their self-doubt into self-love. And I cannot wait to hear, you know, some about that, but with a scientifically uh, proven method. And, you know, you of all people, I know live what you teach. And um, again, I've just, I can't wait to, to hear from you today. I'm excited. So, <laughs> so let's talk. Let's let's just get started. Let's talk a little bit about your journey to success and and whether you want to start with, you know, where you were going into this new path with your wife, but just open up and kind of share with us a little bit into some of those pivotal moments 
mm-hmm. of making that switch and what led you to where you are today? It was very simple. I started with the entertainment for one reason. It was not a fun reason. Mm. As, uh, as uh, you mentioned that I have been bullied due to my hearing impairment. I've been bullied a lot and I was told that I can't do anything. I'm not going to achieve anything. And it's uh, a lot of it escalated when I was uh, 15, 14, 15 years old. And when my dad passed away, I was extremely sad about it. And I was taken to see a psychiatrist. And he's like, you know what? You're depressed. You have ADHD. You got to take medicine. You got to do this. And he gave me a whole list of things to do. And it's funny. I recently recovered those documents. It was a funny read. It was a fun read for me. And I remember it clearly telling me, you're not going to get anywhere unless you take uh, um, ADHD and uh, antidepressants. I was thinking, listen, my dad just passed. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not going to be a happy-go-lucky. It was For me, it was sudden. I didn't expect it. And uh, I was just, it was a lot of anger at that time that came. And the kid took over, and I wanted to prove the world that I'm going to be a, a name to be reckoned with. Wow. So I got, took up on uh, the magic. Not Magic Mike, not that kind of entertainment. Uh, you know, so the, just the magic stuff. And I just started really practicing and I started going against everything everyone else was doing. So I was paving my own road. I couldn't hear, but so I learned how to read lips, which was very beneficial. And through time, this anger is just grew. It grew and it grew. As uh, my career grew as well. You know, I felt that, you know, I've uh, performed everywhere. I've met with uh, celebrities, met with legends out there. And I was told, uh, I, w- I met up with a, with a friend of mine at the time. And uh, they told me, you know, you have like the perfect life. And that's when my entire world shattered. And the reason being, my life was so far from perfect. Because I wasn't even living as myself. People saw me as this confident guy. People saw me as a successful guy. I didn't see that at all. In fact, I hated myself. There were five attempts at suicide. Mm. Thankfully, I failed it. I'm not good at failing things, but this one was a good failure. So I wasn't happy at all. And I knew that where my You know, it was sort of like a dream became my nightmare. And I knew that if I was going to go, continue going to that path, pleasing other people for the sake of just that feeling of fame, feeling important, you know, it wasn't going to go well. So that's when I decided to, you know, look into coaches. I read books, uh, took courses on uh, self-help, self-love, uh, overcoming challenges, overcoming uh, negative thoughts. And that's when I realized that I can overcome them, yes. But as everyone who overcomes their problems, they realize very quickly that these problems always come back. So I, re- I thought, okay, overcome, I'm not, if I'm going to overcome the problems, they're going to come back. What's the point of overcoming them anyways? Right? I, was on, I was walking on a thin line. I'm like, either I'm going to do something with my life or I'm just going to give up and die. That's the only two options I had. So I decided to find a way to, I guess, overcome the overcoming. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead, I realized that everything that I've had, this self-doubt, this fears that I've had, I had to conquer them. To the point where they will not come back. You know, live, waking up every morning, being afraid that someone out there is going to take my spotlight. Wow. That everything's going to disappear. As the, everything that I've worked hard for will just vanish. I was fearing that I was never good enough. And I would self-sabotage myself, get into drugs. Not uh, the easy kind of drugs. Very heavy drugs. 
So I had to get out. And right then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave the magic part. And maybe I can still do some entertainment on the acting side. So I picked up a few roles uh, in a few, a few films, and I realized I'm still the same person. And the, real, the reason why was because I was still living in that persona that I created for magic. So I had to do something about it, and I knew that, you know what? I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to find out how to conquer these fears of mine. And then when I did... I wrote a mini book on it, and I called it the F Principle, and the F stands for fearless. So, so it was supposed to be a quick start guide, and it became Amazon's bestseller. I was like, okay, there's something here. Maybe uh, I could teach. So I was looking for a coach, someone who can help me out. I found one. It was a good investment. It was a $20,000 investment. He said, yeah, you're going to do this, this, and this, and this. Do everything I say. Everything's going to go great. I'm like, perfect. Smooth transition. <laughs> great. <laughs> so we get started. And with coaches, you usually you, you, uh, you pay up front, right? So right. Uh, everything went well, except for one thing. As I transitioned, all the following that I've had in the entertainment left there. And the whole fear of starting over became a reality. So I'm like, okay, this sucks. What can I do right now? So I, was, I acknowledge that, the fact that, okay, this is going to be harder than I thought. And that was the birth of a company called The F Principle, where I made it, I was told, you know, listen, you have to find all the entrepreneurs. They will pay tons of money for a program that can help them conquer fears, not overcome fears because those fears will come back, but to actually conquer them, get them a mindset and help them conquer, teach them how to conquer. That's what uh, I was taught, told by the coach. And everything went on, I, it started picking up. And I'm like, okay, it's not necessarily as I would hope so, because I was kind of left alone after the coaching was done. It's like, okay, boom, you're on your own. See ya. I <laughs> think so. I was like, okay, I have to start promoting it. So yeah, people were getting it. There were times when I was like, I was struggling because, you know, to get to entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs, from my understanding, have a very difficult time admitting that they're afraid of things. Right. Mm -hmm. And here I am promoting this, you know, let's conquer the fear together. I've hosted challenges, very intense workshops. And I'm talking really intense because there was still a part of me from the entertainment side that was had that held on to the anger. Mm. So instead of getting people to respectfully conquering the fears, I created very intense workshops that angrily got them to conquer fears. I don't know if you remember the saying that I've had back in the day. You know, it was very, it was very aggressive. I had, it was 200 people that signed up for a week-long, like, boot camp. Mm -hmm. Only five came out of that, finished it, because it was too intense wow. for other people. So wow. I was thinking, okay, there's something wrong. I was looking for another mentor, another coach, um, and then, or someone who can help grow the F principle. You know, and at that time, it was also my wife and I were still just trying to get to know each other. We weren't married. We weren't even dating. It was just in uh, 2020 when it was uh, the whole pandemic thing started. Mm -hmm. We decided we we're going to start living together travel so we met in Croatia and then we met a person who gave me a guarantee that he can take out of this program to conquer fears and he can bring it out to the world that was a guarantee that was a, a, a contractual uh it was a, it was a contract right so and i saw you know a, a lot of mutual people uh followed him we saw that okay you know what 
we didn't really have those funds available yet. There goes another 20K uh, that uh, both my wife and I put into this, uh, into the F principle. So months come, months go, we realize that they're not doing anything. They're not really, they were doing the complete opposite. And I am so grateful for that $20,000 loss. I remember that. So, and, you know, we're thinking, yeah, should we sue or this or that? Or, I'm grateful for it because that's what got me started to, to teaching myself everything, the marketing of things, how to market the courses. And, uh, of course, money was tight. I had to think about, okay, we need to make money. I started coming up with challenges, you know, to conquer fears. And then it's like, hey, these challenges, they are great. But after the challenges, people stop working on themselves. Then let's try seminars, workshops, everything, everything. I've tried it. Every time, there's no support after that. And I even tried, you know, bumping up the price to specifically target entrepreneurs at a certain stage in their career. And again, while it was working, I didn't feel good about it because I feel that everyone should have access to my teachings and what, what I help with. So I, I was just in this rut thinking, okay, am I just going to quit this, Go maybe go back to entertainment or figure something out? And then I, it took, I took a little break. It was a very difficult year last year um, because my mom was sick. It was her final moments. And I took it the time, you know, to step away from the business and start doing my own research. I know it works. Mm -hmm. All of the clients that I have had, they found success in the program, except they, and I've noticed a pattern in that old program with conquering fears that after a few months, the clients contact me and they're like, hey, I'm regressing here, here, and here. And I'm like, okay, well, everything's in the program. You just stopped practicing. You stopped doing things. And that's when I realized the biggest problem with a course, with courses in general, is that there is no guidance. And accountability, probably. Exactly. That's when uh, my wife and I, we were thinking, okay, we let, what if we, we leave the F principle aside? Because it started off with anger and, you know, the whole transition. We start something fresh. And I've also come to a huge understanding, which was a very bitter pill to swallow, of why so many people are not getting, not keeping those results. And the reason is because we started way too far ahead. And we completely skip the foundation. And the foundation of fear, the foundation of fear is self-doubt. And then when it hit me, I started doing the research. I'm like, okay, there's all of these, there's science around this. I don't have to come up with anything. There's proven methods out there that are not difficult to do. And it's, there's, it's proven right now that 85%, at least 85% of the global population struggle with self-doubt. Mm -hmm. And that has been scientifically linked to stress and anxiety. Of course, going into depression, I'm not gonna get into that because I'm not a doctor, but it goes there. It also affects people's lives and decision-making abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. I was gonna ask you a question. Do you think to Emmanuel, some of that self-doubt is caused by the things that have happened to them in the past. 100%. The things, the things that have been told to them as a child or as they were growing up. 100%. 100%. And that's why, you know, when uh, my wife and I decided to create Heart and Soul, we wanted to create something completely like spiritually holistic with coaching, mentoring, guidance, spiritual practices, you know, and 
I mean, it, there's been proven that Reiki, uh, an hour of Reiki is like having a four hours of sleep, if not more. Yes. It lightens you up. We're bringing yes. science into this. Yes. And also guided meditations. Yes. So absolutely. The past affects the present. Yes. Something that you said, um, and I went through this, Emmanuel, this past year myself, in that I recently myself changed directions in what I was doing. And I had this mental block to where there were certain things I couldn't do in my business that I needed to do. And Brandon, who you know, who we mm -hmm. also met on Clubhouse, at the time was coaching me. And he kept telling me that I needed to do certain things on social media and I could not do them. And I could not figure out why I could not do them. Number one, I had self-doubt, which was causing self-confidence issues. And as we began to talk through those things, I said, I need to talk through this, which I have found out through my human design, I have to do is I have to talk through things out loud. Was as I had gone through my weight loss journey, part of that was my self doubt and self confidence issue. But I yo yo with with dieting, and so we started talking about that. And do you know, Emmanuel? You'll be able to relate to this, but it came back to the things I've been told in the past, which were our lies that we begin to believe because of what we've been told. And, you know, I'll tell you such as when you get pregnant, you gain a lot of weight and you can't lose it. So I gained 50 pounds and had a rough time losing it because that's what I had built myself up to believe. Then after that, you know, when you have a hysterectomy, when you do that, you don't take, if you're not taking hormones, whatever, you don't keep yourself balanced. You have a hard time losing weight. Therefore, you're yo-yoing or you, you're struggling to lose it. So I gained even more weight. Well, when you reach the age of 40, that's what every woman hears. Well, when you reach the age of 40, it's even harder to lose weight. So what happens to me? I gain more weight at age 40. And so these are all things that I was expecting to happen. And so because I expected those to happen, they happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so you would lose, I would lose a few, but because I always knew, well, I'm not going to keep it off because when I reach the age of 40, you don't, you yo-yo, right? And so when on my call with him, I was like, wait a minute. How many skinny people do I know that have had babies and are skinny? How many people do I know that have had hysterectomies and are skinny? How many people do I know that work out and are over 40 and they're skinny? But how many years did it take me, Emmanuel, to realize that? And when I realized that, pounds started dropping. And now when I hear people say, oh, I can't lose weight or, oh, I'm over 40, I'm like, uh, 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 let's, let's go back and let's talk about that because that is a lie. You do not have to believe that. That is a lie. And so I, I think those things from the way our, I say our parents, I'm, you know, my parents were good, but there are things that my dad has said to me that still are in here. And, you know, parents that have mentally or physically abused children, those things are bullying. Like you said, they get stuck in our head and we believe those things which cause self-doubt, self-confidence. They bleed over into our corporate roles. They bleed over into entrepreneurship. They bleed over into college. 
they bleed over into all of these things, which get us stuck, Mm -hmm. which I'm so thankful there's people out like you that help people get unstuck because had it not been for that day, number one, I don't know that I would have ever lost now as much weight as I have, but also being able to show up now, like I've wanted to show up. And I still have work to do. It's an everyday struggle sometimes to to do what I do. But the good news is, is it can be overcome. So keep talking. But I wanted to ask you if you thought that same thing, that it's the lies that we believe in ourselves that we do have to overcome. Number Again, one, we have to we have to figure it out. Yeah. So uh, here's the thing. When we're t- told things, right? How it works is someone tells you something, let's say, hey, you know, um, Atanya, you're amazing. Feels good, right? Mm -hmm. Someone else says that you're amazing. Yeah, I'm amazing. And you start feeling good, right? Because you're, and then you start thinking, first you think that you're amazing, then you start Mm -hmm. feeling that you're amazing, and then you Mm -hmm. become amazing yourself. Same Mm -hmm. thing goes if it's something negative. Mm -hmm. So, If you spend a lifelong of saying you're not good enough, you're going to start thinking that you're not good enough. Right. Because you've been told that. Then your brain is going to program it to believe it. Mm -hmm. And then it will become it. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are stuck. They're not Mm -hmm. stuck. They think they're stuck. Right. There is nobody on this planet stuck. I don't believe that. Yes, there are certain circumstances out there in us in other countries. I'm not talking about external circumstances. I'm talking about mental circumstances. Right. Right. So, right. for example, I mean, uh, a lot of people that I've been helping recently, they're like, yeah, I'm so stressed. I can't get anything done. I'm like, you're not. You're telling yourself how stressed you are. So I created a meditation specifically for them. They listen to it. Eight minutes, boom, stress gone. Now what? What are you going to do now? I have a whole lot of things to do. When people are stressed, they do things that stressed people do. Mm -hmm. Roll through social media. They uh, do other things that they eat as well. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, I was a very uh, binge eater. I'm, I'm like, when I'm stressed, I eat a lot. And then you would get arguments. There are people who are more, um, quote, unquote, alpha males uh, who would say stress is good. It pushes you further. you got to be stressed because that's how you're going to get the results that you're looking for. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there is good stress. Right. Right. So, for example, when I was proposing to um, Amanda, my wife, I was stressed. I was like (laughs) excited and stressed. Right. But that's called you stress. If you, but then when you stress for too long, you're going to get into distress, which is the right. bad kind of stress, the stress that causes anxiety. And Impacts so Impacts your health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So if uh, we are to overcome, again, as I mentioned, if we are to overcome our challenges that we are thinking about, they will be back. Mm-hmm. And it will be a struggle to do things every day. Mm-hmm. Right? If we find a way to conquer these challenges, Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, these challenges will you'll realize that they're it's it looks like a big challenge, but when you start conquering it, it goes smaller and smaller and smaller until you realize it's like a lentil. Right. Just eat it. Right. And there's nothing there. That's why I always encourage people, even even think about, you know, before you're going to say something. You know, when you have when you want to express gratitude. Oh, I'm so grateful that I'm making a lot of money. People can be grateful for that. But be, what people forget is to be grateful for the right things, such as they're grateful for the fact that they even open their eyes so they can get out of bed. The fact that all of their limbs are moving so they can eat or have coffee so that they can travel to work. Mm-hmm. And actually work and get home 
for, I mean, depends on how, many, how often they get paid. If it's, uh, you know, twice a month, we work for two weeks just to get paid. Right. Right. It's people. And that's why they are unhappy because they got a lot of things mixed up. And I don't blame them. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not their fault. You know, we have a, like, for example, when we have a mental block, and it's easy to say, oh, force yourself away, force it into doing something, go, you got to find something. But we forget to acknowledge it. Right. Because life is both good and bad. There is no darkness without light. There's no shadows without light. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, and vice versa, there's no light without darkness. Right. You know, yeah. my, um, I'll add this little tip to what you're saying, because I think it, it fits well with what you're saying. And I think your meditations is perfect. Um, for this. And it's really, I, I needed to hear it. Um, this past week, I had gone to the dermatologist and I was telling her, uh, my father has been, is really ill right now. And, uh, she was telling me before I left, she said, I want to share with you that every single day you need to find joy in every single thing. And she said, it may not be joyful. The day may not be joyful, but try to find something to be joyful about or be grateful for. And she said, because when your body is stressed, whatever is ill in your body, the stress attacks whatever is ill and will feed upon that. Absolutely. And I loved that illustration. Because um, we were, um, she had, she had taken, she had removed a mole off my back. And so she was using that as an example. And so she was saying, um, you know, let's just say that someone has, um, has cancer or they have a heart issue or they have some type of problem. She said, your stress will feed off of that, pro of that issue and manifest. And so she said, you know, rather than, you know, getting stressed out, reverse that and look around and try to find something to be grateful for, or joyful for, and just acknowledge that you're becoming stressed and try to revert that and just be aware that, you know, stress attacks whatever is ill in your body. And I thought, wow, that's so powerful. Um, because we were talking about how many people, um, I had, had gone in for another appointment earlier and we were just talking about how many people have the flu, how many people have had COVID, how many people she had been seeing. And we were just like, you know, our nation is, is so stressed and so ill right now. And, and so we were just talking about how stress attacks the body. And so we do need to learn to chill and meditate and divert that stress somewhere else. Absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, that's, uh, that's why it's very important, you know, to also surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. That's critical. You know, and one of the things actually that um, I've learned recently and I, that I would love to share is if you're going through a bad time, take a deep breath and just say, right now, it's like this. And then exhale. That is one of the most, I can't even explain. It's so powerful. And it's something that I've done, I've been doing every day. And I teach all of my students right now. How, yeah. how to do it, what to do it, you know, when to do it. So, yeah, that is, uh, that's the importance of even like meditation doesn't have to be yeah. eight minutes or five minutes, right? There are some meditations. I personally, I meditate. There's medita there are meditation they do for an hour and 23 minutes. You know, there's some serious meditations out there mm -hmm. as well. But one thing I've noticed, 
since I started meditating, since my wife introduced me to meditation, I haven't been as stressed. I don't get stressed anymore. And since I let go of the stress, I actually lost 30 pounds. Wow. Like stress alone. I don't work out. Yeah. I should, but I don't. Yeah. I eat healthy. I want to eat healthy. It's just I'm not, I'm not getting these urges to go and sabotage myself. Congratulations. That's phenomenal. I mean, I know too, for me, I, since I've lost it and I've learned to divert a lot of that, I will get up from my desk and take my dog and go walk, breathe, meditate. I remember in corporate, I had a coach once who said, set your alarm for twice a day. And, you know, he knew I didn't have a whole lot of time in corporate to, to meditate, but he said, find some relaxing music on YouTube or wherever and set your alarm for 60 seconds if that's all you could do. And that was all I could do back then. Mm -hmm. But I would set it for 1130 and 130. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I would turn my chair around against the window and, and the door was back this way behind me. And just for 60 seconds, um, I would just close my eyes and just listen to it was the sound of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I would just close my eyes and just listen to that. And it was so refreshing. Um, so, you know, 60 seconds twice a day. You don't have any idea until you do it, how yeah. that can help. Absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, of course, like if uh, there's other other ways around it, right? Like, for example, one of the exercises that I give to all my students right now is 50, at least 15 minutes a day, three times a day, you're going to see drastic changes in your life, mm -hmm. starting within 24 hours. And it's amazing. It's, it's scientifically proven to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's the beautiful thing, you know. When uh, when you're working out of love, mm -hmm. you you don't react out of fear or out of any negative emotions. That is amazing. Amazing. I love that. I, I love that. So let's talk about growth for a minute. Um, how do you and your wife stay up to date, I guess, um, in growing yourselves in your business, keeping yourselves up to date with the new techniques or, or does things seem to stay the same in your line of business? Um, how do you, um, you know, keep up with your personal development, your business mm -hmm. development, those types of things, so your growth we're both, mindset. We're both growing. Right now, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually learning and I'm getting a certification to be a, uh, you know, I, uh, I guess, a meditation uh, teacher. So I'm oh, able wow. to guide meditations, live meditations. Right now, that's, uh, that's the meditations that I make right now are part of that certification. So wow. custom, uh, custom uh, uh, meditation is something I'm adding to the repertoire. My wife is uh, becoming uh, certified in, uh, with uh, cacao rituals, you know, it's, and it's just an opening the heart. It is so, there's so much beauty and growth. It's just when we know what we want, mm -hmm. where we are headed to, you can actually grow. Now, another thing in terms of growth, oftentimes, and I'm really guilty of that, of one, uh, being a control freak back in the day. I want something, I'm going to go get it, right? And that's a huge mistake because you set a direction where you want to go, but life will send you towards where you need to be. So it may not even be aligned with your life and you think you want it. Maybe your ego wants it. But when you give up, 
everything and you surrender, then you, as Metallica mentions, how can I be lost when I've got nowhere to go? When you surrender and accept the path that needs to go your way, that mm -hmm. is ultimate never-ending growth. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much truth to that. And I would tell anyone in the audience that wants to do something but doesn't know what to do, I would say, what do people come to you for? Because whenever I was consulting with banks and I put myself right back into my corporate job, and I knew that's not what I really wanted, but I didn't know what I wanted. And I stepped back and I was like, but what is everybody coming to me for? Mm -hmm. Things, things will align the way they should align. A hundred percent. Um, it, it does. I mean, is you don't have to force. You just don't have to force it. And like you say, I mean, I do tell people, if you want something, go for it. You know, if you want it, go for it. But I also believe that you don't have to work hard for it. If there's something that's out there for you, people are going to come towards you and ask you for it. Um, because what I do now is not ever what I thought that I would do. It just happened to be a strength that I had that people were coming to me for. And mm -hmm. I wasn't charging people for it, Emmanuel. And people were saying, what do you charge people for that? And I'm like, I don't. That's, that's just what friends do. And they were like, but why? Why are you not charging for it? And then when I had to just step back and say, why do I not charge for it? Apparently, this is something that needs to be charged for. And then I just stepped back and said, how do you make a business out of it? You know? Yeah. And, and you just, people will come to you for what you're good at. And then you go from there. Absolutely. What are Absolutely. your strengths? hundred percent. Just, just like you, you are so good. I mean, your voice is so calming anyway. And to guide a meditation, that is so down your, your, your expert. I mean, I, expertise is not the right word. That's just so you, that's who you're made to be. Um, that's who God made you to be, because in Clubhouse, when you would talk to people, you had such a calming way. Guide is the right word. You had such a calming way to guide people and to calm people and to direct people and to encourage people. And you were so perfect at it. And I'm not one bit surprised that this is where you've ended up because it's the right thing for you. I am very surprised. And I'm I know not. that it's, I am not going to, I'm not going to be exactly where I am. Uh, it's uh, interesting because I always wanted to be, uh, like back in the day, I uh, wanted to be that famous guy, you know, uh, super, uh, this uh, the super celebrity kind of guy. I'm I've changed a lot and drastically. I, and change comes in many forms. The biggest change started happening when uh, my wife and I met. So you know, phenomenal. and then it's the people you meet. I don't. I no longer you know stick with what I feel what I've wanted to stick with. Like for example, I had a mentor before. I thought you know what I want to I need to stick with this person because they are making what I want to make. But then I've quickly come to realize that in this life, you can't stick to one person and worship them. 
Mm-mm. That is not the way to go. Mm-mm. The question is, and always will be, you know, depending where you end up, are you happy? Mm-hmm. Do you unconditionally love yourself? That is the most important thing. You've been brought to believe that it's about money. Mm-mm. It's about fame. It's about how many cars, how fancy your house is. Mm-mm. That's not what success is. Mm-mm. Again, you know, in the entertainment industry, I thought, you know, people thought I was super successful. I thought I was super successful, but in reality, I wasn't. I was miserable. And now it's what success truly is, is how happy are you inside? Absolutely. You know, that's that's how I look at a, if a person saying, oh, I'm successful. I have uh, this, this and this. And I ask them, OK, great. Why are you talking about these things instead of talking about how happy you are? Mm-hmm. and how much you love yourself. Mm-hmm. And one person actually told me that, you know, it's impossible to unconditionally love yourself. And that's not true. It's mm-hmm. a, one of the biggest myths that, you are, that self-love is selfish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. And in a way, I thought about it, and I'm like, okay, so what if it would be selfish? So what if you're selfishly selfless? Be selfish for yourself so you can be selfless for others. Is mm-hmm. that selfish? No. So that's the kind of theme I like uh, to get people into. I want them to understand that they, it's okay to be quote unquote selfish because it's only an opinion of someone else that you are being selfish. Right. Because they're used to you being selfless. They're used to walking all over you. Mm-hmm. They're you, used to you doubting yourself. And doing everything you can to make them feel better. You know, I've had a student, a client, who did not want to change their career paths because they had so many clients and they were afraid to let them down. And I told them, you you have two options here. You can continue serving them and have them let you down in the end. And then ultimately, you won't be able to continue serving them because you don't, there's so much negativity in yourself. You're so tired and burned out. How can you serve them? Right. That purpose is no longer there. Right. They, and, or you can start fresh. If they still like you for who you are, what makes you happy, they will support you regardless. Right. 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 Well, and two, um, you know, I shared with someone that I interview successful entrepreneurs on the podcast. And this guy said, oh, well, that's not me. And I said, oh, hold on just a minute. You didn't have me define success. (laughs) And I said, success is really a lot of definitions. I didn't say success was millionaires or billionaires, you know, that defining success meant I interview people who make a lot of money because success is, did you go from the bottom of a company to the top of a company without a college degree? Or did you do it with a college degree? You know, I said, there's all kinds of ways To define success, I just named off a ton of different things. And he went, wow, you interview all those types of people? And I said, yes. People's success is different. Their challenges are different. And audiences want to hear different types of success because not everybody is going to make a million dollars or a billion dollars. So, you know, I want people to understand that they can be different and be successful. And Absolutely. he was like, I might fall in that I mean, category. Bob Marley, I think, is, uh, he has a quote. I'm not sure if it's Bob Marley or someone else. Uh, you, he said that you're so poor that all you have is money. And I love that. I do too. 
What about relationships? What about, what about you know, you know yeah. self love? Yeah. What about, yeah, a family? Absolutely. I feel the ultimate goal is unconditional self love. Yeah. It'll, and I promise everyone listening, everyone watching, that once you achieve this level of self love, not only will you attract the person of your dreams, you will, or if you are already in a perfect relationship, you know, you will actually improve it. You won't fight as much. Because where do arguments come from? Where do fights come from in relationships? Mm -hmm. Doubt? Doubt? Fear? fear unknown? Mm -hmm. And when you love yourself to the point where you welcome the unknown, that's when you're going to see everything that you ever dream of come to life. Yeah. Wow, that's phenomenal. What a great story, what a story. Emmanuel. What a great story. What is a piece of advice, piece of advice that, you that you would leave with the audience today? The best piece of advice that I can always, always uh, suggest is be real and authentic with your self-love. Don't say, oh, I love myself. I love myself. Who's this guy? You know, just don't or don't feel attacked when someone challenges your self-love. Look at it deeply and realize that, hey, if you don't fully love yourself, you got to start. And I, I'll tell you right now, the five steps to self-love. And not, it's not just my steps. These are scientifically proven steps. Now, step number one, self-forgiveness. Once you forgive yourself, you go to that step number two, which is self-acceptance. You accept who you truly are as a person. Then you go to self-gratitude, which is number three. This is crucial. Number four is self-care. And number five is self-trust. That's, that's my five-step roadmap to self-love. If you want to go on this journey, I'm, of course, we're all here to help you. And where can they find you, Emmanuel? At heartandsoul.co. And it's heart, N, as the letter N, soul.co on Instagram heartandsoul.co. Uh, they can find uh, me on Facebook. Uh, they can find both my wife and I. But mostly we are, stay, we are staying active on Instagram right now. But again, we never know where we all end up. There may be retreats, workshops. I'm not spoiling anything yet. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for, so much for being here. Again, such a pleasure, such a pleasure, such a pleasure to pleasure see you face to face. Well, the pleasure is mine. So thank you. Mm. So those of you in the audience, I highly recommend connecting with him. You will not regret it. And do not forget that if you enjoyed today's episode, express your support by liking and subscribing to the podcast and to this episode specifically. Provide your comments to what you enjoyed to the episode. And I encourage you to join our group, Influence and Growth Mastery, on Facebook. And until the next time, keep cultivating your connections and growing your influence. And excuse me, I got tongue tied there, but cultivating your connections and growing your influence. Together, we're going to master the art of impact. This is Tanya Gossage signing off with Emmanuel. 